And we're in the book of Jude. You can pick any chapter you'd like. There's 25 verses in the book of Jude. And I'm going to read beginning with verse 14 and read the rest of the book of Jude. That way, if we don't get into the book of Jude, you'll have to say, we were in it. <laughs> Starting out. Amen? We were in it. That's right. You never know. Brother Jimmy, it's good to have you. I'm glad to be He's here. He's the pastor of the Galena First Baptist Church and a good friend, very powerful man of God. And it's an honor to have you as my friend. It's an honor to be what here. What a blessing you are. And we'll try not to mess that friendship up tonight. We never will. We never will. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Trust me, we're pretty much on the same page. Amen. Absolutely. All right. You want to have a seat? We'll get started. And um, I'm going to sit down and ask the rest of you to stand up for the reading of God's Word. Okay. <laughs> I got up at 3 o'clock this morning, so I'm sitting down. Verse 14, and we're going to read down to verse 25. Then Jimmy has some things, and I have some things, and we're just going to see some good stuff. And he knocked also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, amen to that, with ten thousands of his saints, that's you and I, to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice that um, uh, um, Enoch preached against ungodliness, obviously. These are murmurs and complainers walking after their own lust and their mouths speak great swelling words, smooth talking men, having men's person as admiration because of advantage. In other words, smooth talk you to get your money, smooth talk you to get your soul. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These are they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. In other words, they, they want to be seen. They separate themselves to be somebody. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some, having compassion, making a dis difference, and others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him, this is Jesus, is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, in other words, all other gods are stupid and dumb. <laughs> Our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be talking about Enoch and uh, the coming of the Lord. Uh, Enoch knew uh, the Lord was coming to judge. I don't think he knew anything about the flood because Enoch actually was taken home 60, about 60, 65 years after Adam died. Noah wasn't born until many years later. And so more than likely Enoch just preached that the Lord was going to come and tear you up if you don't get it right with God. I don't think, I don't think he not preached, um, you know, turn or drown. I don't think he knew anything about the flood. But he did know about God coming in judgment. And you'll see that in Revelation chapter 19, where Jesus Christ comes with ten thousands of his saints, as Enoch spoke of. And so we're going to be looking at some things. We're going to be looking at... Um, uh, we're going to be looking at Enoch walking with God. We're going to be looking at Seth had a son by Enos, and then uh, the story of Methuselah. You ready, Jimmy? You I am. Go for it, I buddy. Am. Well, just a couple of things. Uh, I've never heard anybody use ungodly more times in one sentence. Yeah. Uh, but maybe that was the only way he could think of to uh, to describe them, and uh, 
And sometimes the correct word is the correct word. The French call it la mot juste, you know, the, the right word, exactly the right word. They were ungodly. He could be describing us today. As a matter of fact, he was describing us today. He was. Because he's talking about, about the second coming of Jesus Christ. You got to hand it to Enoch because he predicted the second coming of Christ before the first coming of Christ. He prophesied the first coming of Christ before the formation of Israel. He, he talked about the second coming of Christ before Mount Sinai. Yeah. He was talking about the second coming of Christ before the flood. That's right. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. So he had a long view. And, of course, as you say so many times, he walked with God. There ain't no telling what God might have told him. That's true. And, and, you know, you look at Enoch and you think about Enoch. I believe he did see two judgments coming, but he didn't understand exactly the extent, the extent of it. And uh, as Jimmy mentioned that it jumps ahead to Revelation 19, the Lord returning with the church, ten thousands of his saints and angels. And so Enoch was quite a character. Enoch at 65 years old, he had a little boy. That little boy's name was Methuselah. Yeah, he, he, he had a contest to see who could come up with the best name, and Methuselah won. That's right. Everybody and, got to and, put a shackle and when, in and the when jar. Me and, and when me and Judy has another baby, we're going to name it Methuselah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking, Jimmy. You know, <laughs> just, just, just kidding. Judy's thinking, Judy's oh my. here, so. <laughs> Judy, Judy's here. She's over there. She's not worried at all. She I knows. thought maybe she was hiding under she, the piano by now. She, I don't. She, she knows I'm too old. Anyway, Enoch walked with God after the baby was born. Now, something happened that caused Enoch to walk with God. You know, the fall, the curse came. And I have no doubt in my mind that something triggered Enoch. And some, said, some say Enoch just looked at Methuselah and said, my, what a good-looking baby. I'm going to follow God. Maybe. But I, because of sin, because of what's happened, I think that Methuselah may have had a terminal sickness, may have had a, a fall, may have had a difficulty in his health, and God spared Methuselah. And that triggered Enoch walking with God. That, that's just a guess, but I think it's a good guess. How many agree with that? I think that's a good guess. Because God, I believe, answered. And I thank God for that. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that Seth had a son by the name Enos. Now, it says that when Enos was born, that's in, uh, in Genesis 4, 26. It says when, when Enos was born, Seth gives birth to Enos. And, and chapter 4, verse 26 says, Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. And I believe that because of that, the curse and sickness and disease, men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Trust me, people hadn't changed. You let things start falling apart, and people start calling on the name of the Lord. You let war break out, you let disease come, and people will start calling on the name of the Lord. Leave people to themselves, they ain't going to call on God at all. But God nudges them and allows them to be under deep, heavy persecution in order to get them to call upon the name of the Lord. And I think Seth probably um, uh, had heard all about uh, his older brothers, that one was dead, Abel. Cain slew him. And then Cain was banished. Cain was gone. Never saw him again. And I'm sure that Adam and Eve told them about all the misery that came about to them in the garden and then to their sons in the field, all because of rebellion against God. And I think maybe Seth's son, uh, was, so they started to call on the name of the Lord. He heard all these stories and says, okay, well, then I need to pray. I need to get close to God. I need to, need to do what's right. And, of course, Adam and Eve would have showed Seth the proper way to sacrifice, the proper way to behave with God as far as they knew because they had actually seen God. We also read in, there was two Enochs. There's an Enoch in chapter 4, 
And there's Enoch in, in chapter 5. Yeah, well, I was talking about Enos, the, Enoch. Uh, the, the, the son yeah. of Seth. Well, I wanted to point out the Enoch. Oh, yeah. I want to point out the Enoch. Uh, Cain, he goes out, verse 16 of Genesis 4. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelled in the land of Nod on the east side of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he, he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So we see this Enoch is not the same as the Enoch in chapter 5 that follows the Lord. Um, so we understand. And by the way, this Enoch also down to his lineage, this bad Enoch, he had uh, someone by the name of Lamech. And Lamech is also mentioned in chapter 5. So there's you know, when Cain has Enoch, Enoch turns around to a series of genealogies, and he has Lamech, and boy, was he a piece of work. He married two wives. It was a big mess. And then we have uh, Methuselah um, is going to be born to Enoch. Enoch has a son, calls his name Methuselah. The one who walked with God. Yes, the one who walked with God. That's the different Enoch. And, and that's the Enoch we want to focus on tonight. Because the other is a deception. By the way, did you know also there's another Lamech um, mentioned in verse 30 of chapter 5? And that's not the same Lamech that's in, that come out of the descendants of Cain. This comes out of Methuselah. And verse 30 says, and Lamech lived after he begat Noah. So he brings forth Noah, the famous guy who built the ark. And so don't get hung up on names because just because your name's James don't mean you're worth much. Just because your name's James doesn't mean you're worth much. Either way. Either way. You can be good or bad. Uh, There's two Jameses up here. That's right. We're, we're two for the price of one. Uh, I'd like to, to, to go back to Enoch before we get away from him. Do it. Do it. Jude, the, just there is an extra can, canonical book, which means it's not included in the Holy Scriptures. It's called the Book of Enoch. Yep, I've it was read it. written probably somewhere, certainly before Christ, but but they believe that it was written around 200 BC, 100 to 200 BC. Copies of it were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, this is, this is the book. Uh, uh, Jude must have had access to this. Now, now, I know that the Holy Ghost could have told Jude what to write down, but I think Jude must have read this and had access to it because he's actually quoting from this book of Enoch. And it's chapter 10, verse 9, that Enoch's quoted where he says, Behold, he comes with ten thousands of his saints. He says, And behold, he cometh with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to destroy all the ungodly, to convict all flesh. See, this is this Sounds is like Enoch. This is judgment, and this is also preaching to repent, to return. Yeah. It is preaching to a point to make a decision. Avoid, avoid hell. There's there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. This is Enoch's, to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly spirit, uh, sinners have spoken against him, against God. I've read and, uh, the book of Enoch. Yeah. And the book of Enoch came over, I believe, on the, on the ark. I believe that there were archives and books that, that Adam shared and with Enoch. Enoch shared with Methuselah. And I believe there were writings that came over on the ark. I believe there were scrolls that came over on the ark. You say, well, why is it the book of Enoch in our canon of scriptures? Well, does it really need to be there? We've got Jude. And there are a lot of books, James, that, that, that we hear about in the Bible that aren't in the canon or aren't in the group of scriptures that, that, that we consider inspired that make up the Bible. Uh, uh, Gad, the prophet, wrote a book. It's yep. mentioned in the, in the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah and Israel. Uh, Jasher, the prophet, yep. whom we know very little about except that he wrote a book. He's and quoted. That, that he ministered, yeah, he's quoted, and he ministered both in Judah and in Israel, the northern kingdom. Where's he quoted in Joshua? Uh, I don't it, remember. It, he's quoted in... Uh, uh, 
I can't remember, James. Tick, I just, tick, 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 tick. Come on. Um, I can look. I was thinking maybe it was in Joshua. I don't remember. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We're just, you know, we're playing with your heads right now. But, you know, Enoch, I, I do believe that the book of Enoch, when I read it, it's about angels. It's about angel warfare. It's about judgment. And so, you know, when you look at the book of Jude, I think it's a good replacement for the book of Enoch because, you know, it's basically yeah, saying it's the same Joshua. thing. Yes, Joshua. It is in Joshua? Mm -hmm. Well, I rung the bell. Amen. <laughs> ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> but now you win the movie prize. Go ahead, go ahead buddy. Well, we're gonna, we were going to give away a door prize, but somebody stole the door. Um, no. Uh, it's laying on the beds in the back of <laughs> yeah, in the back it's of Bobby's, truck. Bobby's truck. But anyway. But I, I, I think that James was right about this coming over on the ark or being preserved through the flood somehow. Because there, there are several other examples. There are some things that, uh, that Matthew, a couple of lines that Matthew quotes that uh, you just can't find anywhere else. Because he says, as the prophet said, he shall be called a Nazarene. Yeah. Well, I have searched the scriptures. It's not there. And, I, and it ain't there. But, well, it's, but the, it's somewhere. There it, was some prophet. Maybe it was one of the non-writing prophets. Maybe it was Elijah or Elisha. It's from the Somebody prophets. said that he one of, that that the the Jews considered a prophet had said that he would be a Nazarene. Matthew had read that somewhere, and he included that in his account. And so there are other there are other works that may have been uh, encouraged, uh, maybe have been. Uh, Blessed by God, but they, they weren't included in the scriptures. They weren't written by the Holy Ghost. And I think we have to go with Peter's definition that these were, that the Holy Ghost wrote these books through men, holy men of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you think about Enoch, he, he, uh, Enoch has Methuselah at 65 years old. Enoch is taken to heaven at 365 years old. Methuselah lives to be 969 years old. So he was, out his, he was at, without his dad for quite a while, but he was also, Methuselah was the grandfather of Noah. Right. And so that makes a, a big story right there because I don't know whether Methuselah helped Noah or not. Probably not because he's probably too stinking old to help much. But anyway, <laughs> but you know, um, it's, it's beautiful when you look at all these people lived at the same time. It's incredible. What do you think, Jimmy? Well, I think that I think that God made an impression on Enoch, and I keep going back to the ideas that says Enoch walked with God. He did, and was not because God took him. Enoch walked with God. If if you're walking with God, and He's right there and He's talking to you, I, I have to think. Well, what's He talking about? What are they talking about? What's He saying? Is Enoch saying, "Well, Lord"? Uh, you know, how's my old boy, Methuselah, how's he going to do, you know? Uh, and he might be asking, well, what do you plan to do in the future, Lord? You know, what are you, what are you going to do? Where, where's this all going to wind up? Or maybe they're walking along and they see, a, you know, they see some, some, they see some really mean kid that's uh, just, just killing ants for no reason or torturing small animals. We've all had, had seen, seen people like that. I was and never like that. You, I'm sure you no, weren't. No. You never put a cat in a sack and swung it around your head, right? No, I was Just good to see boy. how loud you, it would you squeal. Did that. <laughs> I'm projecting, you know. That's yeah, what you, you're, 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 you are. You're projecting. But I mean, he would look at he would look at nature, and he would look. You know, this is this is awful. This is awful. You know, nature's so rough. If I don't go inside at night and and latch my door, these beasts will come in and kill me. You know. How long is it going to be like this? They must have had some very deep conversations. I'm sure they did. I, I'm sure they did. Uh, Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was translated, that same word translated, raptured, that he should not see death. That's what the church is going to see. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. Boy, that's a, that's a challenge to all of us today. We want to please God. And how does that chapter start out? Without faith, it is impossible to please verse him. Verse 6, verse 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For they that come, 
cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. That's connected to the life of Enoch. So that's powerful when you stop and think about uh, Enoch's walk with God. And he was taken at 365 years. He didn't die. He was taken to be with the Lord. In fact, they looked for him. As I said before, there's, you know, uh, Russia has the cosmonauts. We have astronauts. God has the was not. The was not. And taken he was up. not. Amen. And so Enoch was taken. They did look for him. The Bible says he was not found, so they did look for him. Yeah. And uh, hopefully the Lord, when he comes, they'll look for you and I too. We'll be gone. Amen. But we'll be gone. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Gone without a trace. I'm ready. Let's go. Are we proceeding to 16? Let's, yeah, let's, let's go. Uh, let's move along in this chapter, uh, this first chapter of Jude and only chapter of Jude. Are you looking at verse 16? Are you looking at, you are? Okay, if you are, then fine. All right. Murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust. <laughs> that makes you want to complain a lot, don't it? And their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of their advantage. Listen, when someone sweet talks you and preaches to you what you want to hear, he's after your money. And we have a lot of people in the churches, in the church world today, that they're after your money. That's a fact. They're not after your eternal destiny, they're after your money. They look at crowds as money. They look at, you know, gimmicks as money. And um, I'm not against having money. I'd like to have a whole and lot I'm, more. I'm not against having a crowd. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have a whole right, lot Chris? more. Like to have a crowd. <laughs> They'd like, like to, to have, have a crowd. Like to have a lot of money. <laughs> verse, seven, uh, verse 17 says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told, this is verse 18, there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own lust, ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves. In other words, they isolate themselves, sensual having not the Spirit of God. You, you know, I, I, I marked a couple of places. He talks about the apostles of the Lord giving us a word on this. And, uh, and back to verse 16 where they, they're, ever, they're trying to seek an advantage, you know, uh, we, we all suffered from one degree of the, or another, whether you're saved or not. We're all plagued with the drive to feather our own nest. We, we have ambition. We have things we have to do. We have kids to raise. We have bills to pay. We have things to do. And, and so you get into those patterns, and, and you're always trying to improve your position. But when it comes to the church, uh, what we see today in what I call the church business, you know, we've got the church of Jesus Christ uh, being run on, on man's principles, on the world's business principles, and it doesn't, it doesn't work. And, and Paul had much to say about this. In, in chapter 16 of Romans, he says, uh, he says <clears throat> in verse 16 of Romans, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, in verse 17, chapter 16, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. See, the first thing, that the first way to tell somebody who's trying to pick your pocket or pick your soul, maybe it's the devil in them trying to corrupt your soul, to ruin your spirit, uh, is, that, uh, is that they say something different. They preach contrary to the doctrine. If... Uh, if someone comes in and they're not saying what James and I or Josh or Chris or, or any of the preachers around here are saying, don't listen to them. If you go to a church where they preach some other gospel, don't listen. Don't, and, and if they're on TV, turn them off. Paul hey, says, I'm avoid them. Okay. Paul says I, to avoid them. Yeah, but not me. But I'm not on television. You. I'm, well, I wasn't referring to you, of course. When I said we, what did you think? I, did you think that I, yeah. that I meant me and Galen? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it says, for such are they that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. You see, they're just in it to get whatever they can get. I can, I can name, but I won't. A half a dozen fellows I know within 30 miles of here whose God is their own belly. 
who are yeah. preachers and yeah. ministers I supposedly of the gospel. That's true. And, uh, and, and it's nothing I want to know, but we have stumbled onto these things in our, in our walk. And it says that, that, that by their good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. A mature Christian should not fall for anything like this, but the new Christian can. We're not talking about lost people getting fooled. We're talking about Christians getting fooled. One of my pet peeves is where, you know, you got some widow that, that uh, sends half of her Social Security check to somebody on TV because they told her that her leg would get better if she did. Now, that just burns me. You know, I tell you what, you can watch all the TV preachers you want to, and I got respect for many of them. But I got to tell you, James, if I get sick, Dr. Jeremiah ain't going to come visit me in the hospital. And is John Hagee going to come preach your funeral? No. Who's John Hagee? Oh, he's a guy on TV. Oh. <laughs> Who's David Jeremiah? <laughs> Oh, he's on the radio every day. Yeah. Yes, he is. And okay. he's, a, he's a pretty good teacher. Pretty good preachers, aren't they? Yes, he, yes they awesome. are. And I'm not lumping them in with the, with the bad people. I'm just saying that. Uh, I, had, I had a guy tell me, and, and I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I had a, when I pastored a church out west, I had my overseer tell me, he said, how are you doing financially? And I said, well, we're doing all right. And he said, well, he said, he said create a crisis. He says, always have a crisis because you'll get more money out of your people. He told me that. I don't want a crisis. I want people to have peace. Well, you know, I started pastoring church, you know, in in Midwest, and I don't have to create a crisis. I'm in them all the time. (laughs) But anyway, but what he was trying to say was, he was trying to tell me, create something for people to give to. And a lot of times when you listen on the radio, they got some emergency that they want to send, you want you to send money into, and they spend 30 minutes, five minutes on the gospel, and then 30 minutes trying to get you to give to that thing. So we need to be careful. Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, he says uh, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Use us for example, and if they don't act like we do, steer away from them. For many walk, and this is Philippians chapter 3, for many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, which Jude will talk about in just a second, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. See, the things that they seek glory in are a shame before God. And, of course, Peter, Peter told us there would be mockers. Now you you got to remember, too, that Apostle Paul, he made tents to make a living to take care of the church. And he actually made money himself laboring so people wouldn't accuse him of these things. But he's also the one that said, don't muzzle the ox when it treads out the corn. Amen? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and labor is worthy of his heart. So, you know... Paul wasn't saying that you, mm-hmm. you don't have to be, you, you can't receive benefits from the church. He's just saying don't ever be accused of being a, a, a grabber, a filthy lucre person. And that's not, not taking any money. It was primarily with the Corinthians because they were so worldly. He didn't, want to, he didn't want them to think that he was taking money from I them. Had, I had a preacher tell me a few years ago, he said, now milk the goats. <laughs> He told me that. He said, milk the goats. Line up. (laughs) And and, and I told the preacher, I said, I don't like goat milk. He said, well, if they come to your church and they're not saved, milk the goats. And I thought, I don't like goat milk, and I'm not going to milk the goats. In fact, I'm not going to milk the cows. Yeah. But you know what he was trying to say. He's trying to say, lost people come to church, get what you can out of them. Don't ever be swallowed into that because people will give money thinking that they're buying their salvation. And we, we need to understand that it's, it's something that comes out of the gratitude of our heart. Yes. And would I receive money from a lost person? Yes, I would. But not on the principle that I'm teasing him or complimenting him. 
that he would mistake or that his gift as a favor. Yeah, we're, we're in, uh, you know, pumping them for money, you know. And yeah. You know, the passage James refers to is in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and this is something we all need to keep before us. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And he's yeah. talking just like the priest lived from the altar and just like the ox uh, lives by eating the corn that he's milling out. Uh, the preacher eats from his work, which is uh, which is preaching the gospel and being the being the under shepherd of the church. So you know what what he's Paul is saying here is pay your preacher. But what Paul is always saying is to be is to be sharp and look for people who are trying to cheat you and to trying to uh, uh, to trying to pick your pocket. That's true. That's See, true. both are true. <laughs> it, it is true. I um you know I'm I'm really tried in all of my ministry to make sure. I had a guy call me up one time. He, he, he saw us on television. He called me up and he said, I've got a lot of money. He said, I want to I talk to you. And, and first of all, when he said, I've got a lot of money, I want to talk to you, I knew wrong. <laughs> you know, because him saying, I got a lot of money, I want to talk to you, he should have said, I want to talk to you. Right. He shouldn't have said, I got a lot of money, I want to talk to you. It's like he's trying to buy my time. And he said, well, I want to talk to you. He said, he said, and I said, well, just talk over the phone. He said, well, he said, I can dump some money in your church, and you can go places in your television broadcast. I've got several hundred thousand dollars I'll dump into yours, but you've got to listen to me. I said, uh, why would you do that? I said, well, wow. I said, uh, the Bible's very clear that God's sheep hears his voice, and a stranger, they will not follow. I said, I'm not interested. Yeah. He said, you're making a mistake. And I said, mistake, I'll just live with it. It won't be the first one, right? That's right. <laughs> and, he, and he didn't come to my church. He didn't come and bring me two or $300,000 and bring me a million bucks because he didn't bring it because he wanted to control me. He wouldn't tell me what to preach. He wouldn't tell me what to do. He wanted glory out of it. If he really wanted to obey God, he'd sent money without even telling me his name. That's right. That's right. While we're fessing up, uh, uh, several years ago before COVID, we had about 50 people coming to Galena First Baptist Church. Yeah. And uh, we, had a, we had a group of rebels there. And uh, I didn't know they were rebels until they invited me to lunch. I think at Ruby Tuesdays, which I think is now closed down. But anyway, they invited me to lunch, and they were just uh, talking about how much they loved me and how wonderful I was and everything. Well, it turns out that they wanted me to leave the church where we were at and start another church that would just, uh, you know, be a little bit more harder and legalistic than the way I preach at my church. And I told them, I said, well, you know, it's not the church that is... Uh, that is that way. It's your pulpit minister. Your pastor is that way. And I said, instead of going and starting another church in the same town, why don't y'all just go to the church where you're at and serve there? What would be wrong with that? And they said, well, they said, well, we'll pay you double what the church is paying you. And I'm thinking, well, what's, what's two times zero? <laughs> No, it was a, it was a little better than that, but I mean, it's like people. There are some people to get their way. They think if they just give you a little bit of money, then you're going to change your mind about everything you've been doing for the last sixty years and just buy it like a catfish. And that's why Jude is talking about this because that's what's wrong with the churches today. There's high cost in entertainment, and if we're if we're going to do entertainment, and I'm not against entertainment. I I don't think church ought to be boring. Hello. Why well, have great singing? Why well, have great? Singing. But when you start get, having gimmicks, then you're getting away from the Word of God. Yes. And, and you know, I think the church ought to have better music than anybody down in Branson. I'm serious. I'm for that. I, I am. I, I believe the church ought to have better music than any theater in Branson because we're singing for the King. Amen. Amen. So I'm not against good music. We need that. What I am against is entertainment that's not actually focus on the gospel. That's very important that we see that. And um, my Baptist friend, I, we're going to come to a verse, and I'm going to get a little Pentecostal on you. 
It's okay with me. It's okay? Do you okay. want me to put my earplugs in or something? No, I don't want you to do that at all. Don't spare, don't spare hey. me, James. I'm ready. Who, who are you talking to? I'm talking okay. to the other James. <laughs> the other James. I'm James <laughs> or less. Anyway. What'd you say? I didn't say anything. They were talking. I just had a weird look on my face. But it's hard to tell because I look weird all the time. Okay, here we go. Verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, let's look at that just for a minute. Okay? I believe at the time of the writing of the book of Jude, the church was under deep, heavy persecution. I believe that it follows the book of Revelation, and Jude is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Amen. And there had already been apostle James that was put to death by the sword. There was persecution in the church. And so he's telling you to build up yourself on your most holy faith. Our holy faith is based on the blood of Jesus. Yes. Our holy faith is based on the finished work of Christ. Yes. Our holy faith is based on the death, resurrection, of Jesus Christ, the sovereign God of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yes. That's our most holy faith. Any faith outside of connected to the blood of Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection is not holy faith. Right. And so uh, we build up ourselves on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, to be fair, I want to say that there is a scripture in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, and, and, I, and I said very, um, very outspoken that there was great persecution in the church. Right. Great heaviness. And so in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. That's pressure, hard time. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so I think Jude verse 20 is talking about praying in tongues, but I also believe it's talking about groaning in prayer. It's talking about deep intercession in prayer. It's talking about crying. It's talking about burden. It's talking about heaviness. It's talking about groaning, making weird noises. Amen. Because the plumbing's all upset inside. And uh, I believe that that verse primarily in verse 20 is about you don't know what to pray. You're really under deep pressure. You're under deep hard times, and you're just groaning. And, and, and if you've ever, how many ever heard a Christian groaning in prayer? Oh, yes. It is unbelievable. Yep. God interprets those groanings. Yes, he does. And, and he, he knows what we should pray. When we don't know what to pray, we fall into heaviness and groaning. So I want to say that right from the start that Romans 8, 26 is talking about deep groanings under deep persecution, crying out to God, tears coming, lots of DNA coming out of your sinuses, crying out to God, sobbing. You know, I, you know you've had a good service when after the service you go by and have to pick up tissue paper off the floor and you have to pick up tissue paper and, and wipe the the mucus off the altar and That's the tears right. off the altar. That's a good service. That's right. I have seen people come to these altars and actually, I'm not kidding, actually get up and there's a puddle of tears on the altar. That's crying and praying in the Holy Ghost. So if you don't pray in tongues, remember that you can groan and, and cry out to God and deep in prayer and intercession. But I also believe verse 20 is talking about praying in tongues as well. I do too, uh, uh, for a number of reasons. But I would like to point out that, 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 that verses 26 <coughs> through uh, 28 actually talks about the ministry of the Holy Ghost in prayer and it describes in a way that Jesus only hinted at in the upper room that the Holy Ghost, of course, he is God, but he is also our conduit 
yes. of prayer. Yes. He is he is how our prayers flow to the Father. He is how the answers come from the Father to us. Yeah. Without that without that connector, uh, that conduit between us and the Father being the Holy Ghost, uh, we would not receive from God and we could not present to God these prayers. Yeah, and, he and, makes and intercession for us. Make it, he, the Holy Ghost himself is praying for us, making intercession for us all the time in the same way that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father and advocate, advocating for us. You know, John says, if a man says we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. And when Satan accuses me, Jesus just says he's mine. And God drops the charges, you know. Have you ever prayed and felt like you were missing it? You, you just sure. wasn't getting there. Anybody felt that way? Well, understand this. The great intercessor takes our prayers to the throne. And I, this is a silly analogy, but it's true. You can pray, God, give me a motorcycle. And the Holy Ghost will say, no, nope, Father, that ain't what he wants. What he really wants is a box of chocolates. Yeah, he wants a <laughs> box of chocolates. Anyway, the, but really, you need to understand that as a child of God, God has sovereign rights to your soul and God can change your prayer before it gets to the throne room because God knows your heart now you may pray and not know how to pray but the intercessor in you will shoot them prayers up into the throne we're talking about the Holy Ghost sending your prayers to the throne to the great intercessor Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost say, this is what this guy needs. This is what this person wants. And the Lord might say, well, but he asked for, you know, a, a brand new Shelby Mustang. And, and the Holy Ghost says, that ain't what he wants. I think James has prayed that prayer. You know what? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to talk about my prayer life. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, you know, we've got a wonderful father. We need to understand when you think you're missing the mark, remember, God takes your prayer to the throne. The Holy Ghost takes your prayer to the throne. And the great intercessor, Jesus Christ, presents your needs to the Father. Praise God. Isn't that good? That's great. Woo! Hallelujah. He does. Even if you don't know how to pray, he presents your needs to the Father. Uh, by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, that would be tongues. I will pray with understanding, that would be when we're praying with our understanding. I will sing in the spirit, that would be tongues. I will sing with understanding that would be O Rugged Cross, the hymns. So we need to understand that, and it's not always tongues, it could be groanings, deep groaning, going to God, and God takes your prayer, he forms it, he makes it. That's why we have the Lord's Prayer. Remember, Jesus said, when you pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy Jesus, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins or our debts as we forgive those that are indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. God can take that prayer and meet every need in your life. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Hey, you know, I'd like to just add to that, James, just, just this. just in, in this church, I don't expect this is true, but I preach in a lot of places where I get the sense that people have the idea that the Holy Ghost is a force or a power or a feeling or an emotion. He's a person. But he is a, not only a person, he's God. He is God. The same as Jesus, the Son, is God. The same as God, the Father, is God. The Holy Ghost is God. And whether you're speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues, 
There is no other pray, way to pray except in the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost is not in us, then we're saying prayers to an unknown God. And, I, and, and, and sometimes he'll answer them, but he's not under obligation to until we belong to him. You know, me and Jimmy were praying with another good Baptist pastor of mine, a good friend, Danny. And we were praying. And the Spirit of God came on me. And, you know, it's a bunch of hooey, bluey, baloney if you think, well, I can't hold it. I just got to do it if God moves on me to do it. The Spirit is subject to the prophet. Yeah, you just, and so you when just the anointing came up. on me and we were praying, uh, because we were praying in known language, right. I'd have been totally out of line to pray in tongues because they wouldn't have known what I was talking about. Right. Yeah. So we were praying in understanding together, and so I didn't do it. And now, we need to understand that you're not spiritual because you get together and everybody chatters. Yeah. You're spiritual because God's given you a gift. And you use it at the appropriate times. And it's the Holy Ghost who administers those gifts. True. Um, you know, just, just, I know we got to get to Q&A, but I, before we get away from this, I just want to say that, that you mentioned a while ago about the, you could tell whether it was good service because of all the, the, the Kleenexes on the floor, all the tissues oh, yeah. on the floor, because everybody's crying. I don't know whether you were with me or whether Josh was with me, but here, my mind just... I'm in so many places this month, I don't know where I've been, but in one of the places I've been, there were no Kleenexes up by the altar benches. And I, and I thought to myself, man, this church is in more trouble than I thought. Oh, I said, yeah. if people come up here to the altar and start crying, where's the Kleenex? You know, that scared me. One passage of scripture, I think, will give us something to think about, about the, the praying based on your most holy, most holy faith and praying in the Holy Ghost. Isaiah chapter 28. Yeah. Uh, this happened to me. I went, I went to Brother Swaggart's church while I was preaching meetings in Mississippi. There you go. And uh, and Ron and I stopped on the way back, and we visited, uh, we visited Family Worship Center, and heard great music, and saw the old man himself play the piano. Yeah. Had a, had a great time. But I sat down after the service. Uh, I just happened. To, I found myself thrown in a pile of people where I was sitting next to Don Paul Gray. And he's one of the old men on the, the talk show, you know, where they, they talk about the Bible. And I asked him about, about speaking in tongues because I don't. I said, I'm a charismatic who don't speak in tongues. And he quoted, quoted to me from here. He didn't even look. And he says, he says in verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, the mature Christian. He's trying, and he was showing me that knowledge and unknowable are tied together. He says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering tongues, stammering yep. lips, with stammering yep. lips and with another tongue, Will he speak to his people? He who, God, and God the Holy Ghost is the one that administers that. And it's sure. totally up to him. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. It's not Coca, 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 Coca. <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to talk in tongues. Coca, 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 Coca. <laughs> yeah, you think. I'm sorry. Hey, I, 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 is that your bad shoulder? I, I wouldn't have, no, this one is, but I wouldn't have laughed if you hadn't have done it so funny. You know, Jimmy, there are people that teach folks how to talk in tongues with Coca-Cola. Oh, my goodness. I'm serious. With uh, the zero or the classic? <laughs> Josh has got the real thing over there. The real thing. <laughs> I tell them at the Mexican restaurant, I know Spanish. Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, <laughs> Dr. Pepper, El Taco. What's Taco it? Bell. We got we got a little while before we can think about tacos. Really? At least we haven't really? asked no, no haven't had any room for questions. That's true, and we're going to have lots of questions because we talked about uh, praying and groanings and and moaning and uttering to the Lord. And it looks like and we gave ourselves another night of Jude at some point. I guess we did. <laughs> but I, I want to say this and. and at the you know, Jimmy's my buddy, and I wouldn't do anything to hurt him in, at all. One time I was driving a, an hour to work, 
And I drove for an hour praying in tongues. Well, when I did that, my spirit was being edified, but my mind wasn't. And so I spent the rest of the day praying at work, God, please give me the interpretation of my prayer. And when I drove back home, I prayed in understanding the exact prayer that I prayed on the way Hallelujah. to work. Hallelujah. What does James say? It was amazing. If any man lack knowledge. Yep. Yep. And pray him for, ask God. Praying for the interpretation. And so, you know, we've already opened up a can of glory worms right now. Well, I'd rather have glory worms than doom worms. <laughs> <laughs> we got to stop. We're going to have questions and or comments. And Jimmy, I love you, buddy. I love and, you. And you're, you're one of the most solid doctrinal persons I've ever met. I appreciate your... Your, your, your candor and your wisdom in the Lord. Amen. If I only had a mind like yours, I'd run for president of the United States. Well, if I only had a body like Josh's, I'd be in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Good looking young man. Yeah. Just remember, you can never be too rich or too thin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pastor, this is not a real spiritual question I'm asking, but I've talked to two or three people that have read the book of Enoch. Yes, you said you've read I have read it. it. I just wanted to ask the question. Do you remember a sin or reading anything in it that's contrary to scriptures? That, that's, that's my question. I've never read I it. I did read some things in Enoch that was a waste of my time. Talking about angels, and you know, I, I figure if God wanted me to know some of the things he was talking about, he would have revealed it to me. Uh, my, mainly, Enoch is about warring angels and about angels fighting. And he does say some things about the fallen angels, and he does refer in the book of Enoch to some of the things in Noah's time before the flood. So, you know, it's, I'm not saying don't read it, you know, don't read the book thinking it's inspired. But if you want to read it, it will trigger your mind, and it will make you think about it. And there, also in Enoch, there's just there's one thing that that sheds a little light, but it also opens questions that we can't answer. Where in Daniel, he talks about the watchers. Yeah. Daniel talks about the watchers uh, watching over things and making sure that everything turns yeah. out right. Yeah. I don't know if these are advanced men for the Lord or if they're a special breed of angels or if they're a seraphim or seraphim with a, with a certain uh, but assignment. I know, they, I know they like to eat because they had a meal. <laughs> really? Look it up for yourself. They had a meal somewhere around Mount Sinai. Stuff. I can't remember. But in Enoch, it talks about that, and there are some things that, that we just can't, that just aren't related to the Bible that we can't put that much stock in. I, I agree with James. Well, you know, you got to look at it like these two. We're warned not to worship angels. We're warned not to be, not to be you know, overly obsessed with angels. But I read, I read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire, and it didn't have nothing to do with the Bible, and I got plenty out of it. Yeah, so. sure. You had brought up the prophecy by Matthew saying that uh, the prophecy, the prophet saying that Jesus was shall be called a Nazarene. If you go to Isaiah 11, 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of the same, out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall come upon him. Well, the word for branch there is Netzer. He shall be called a Netzerine, which means he shall be the branch man. So Netzerine, Nazareth, is, is the coming from the, the Hebrew word Netzer for branch. And if you go to John 145, uh, it says, Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of... How did they know Jesus of Nazareth was being written by the prophets? Because he was Netzer, the branch. And the Nazarenes, the city of Nazareth, knew this. 
and they knew they were the branch city. They expected the Messiah to come out of their city. They were ridiculed, they were made fun of. And if you remember, it says, Nathaniel said unto him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Those idiots, they, don't, they think this is a branch. They think the Messiah is coming. And yet they were right, because uh, even the demons, oh thou Jesus of Nazareth, they realized he was a branch man. So fulfilling Isaiah, fulfilling Jeremiah, fulfilling the prophets, that he was the branch. So, so I've read this before. Are you suggesting that perhaps the, the translators should have translated that branch instead of Nazarene? Well, um, in the New Testament, in the Matthew passage? That's a good point. I don't know. Because I, I don't know the languages, so I don't know It does know mention him as the branch in some of the minor prophets. Yeah, Zechariah is the branch. Jeremiah calls him the branch yeah. twice. Jeremiah, Isaiah. So yeah, that's it does true. Seem that, uh, that's what that Matthew was talking about. He should be called the Nazarene, the branch. But I Philip, think I, like you said, I mean, Nathaniel made fun of him because, like, gosh, can anything good from there come from there? Like, you know, there are a bunch of hillbillies up there. How could anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah, and Philip says, "Come and see." Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, the, the Messiah is coming out of Nazareth. I think it was an unspoken thing too that carried down through the ages. The prophets had mentioned it, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Amen. Anybody else? Question or comment? Oh, come on. I'll share something. Good. <laughs> Put the mic up to Charlie so, so we can hear okay. him laugh. Okay, so I, I, I can really relate with Pastor. I was driving to measure a, a house for some flooring, and it was like a good hour out. And, I'm just praying and singing and worshiping the Lord. Well, I really got over, I, I had been given uh, the gift of tongues. And so I had, I had done that in praying many a time, but I had never sang in tongues. Well, what happened was I'm just singing along and I'm just crying and I'm thriving and I'm just really overcome uh, with the presence of the Lord. And I began to sing in tongues, and when that came out of me, it shocked me. And I went, oh, oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that just came out because I didn't know about you could sing in tongues. I thought I did something wrong. It just came out. It was so deep. So it was really kind of uh, funny because I was so young in, in it, I didn't know that that would happen yeah. to you. But it did happen to me, and it was a beautiful thing. Well, I got a question, I didn't do and this, it was this isn't really a joke, Gayla. I mean, I'm serious. I, I'm curious. When you sang in tongues, was it a melody that you knew, a melody you already had in your head to a song you know, or was it a different melody? I'm just curious. Well, you know, it was. It, it kind of went along with whatever song I was singing in English, mm -hmm. but I, I went off into diff, just different notes, mm. and it was really actually very beautiful. And But I only got a couple of sentences, I'm sure, of, the, of that new song out before it. I my ears realized what I was doing because I yeah. thought I was maybe blaspheming or doing something wrong because I didn't know you could sing in tongues at that time because I was young enough. In. I was just curious. There's so little about written about it. Yeah, so it was really an amazing thing when that comes bubbling out of you. It's, it is. It's like a it's like a river. Uh, it comes out and, and, and there was no way at all I could have uh, spoke English when I opened my mouth. It just did its thing. Well, you all know that awesome. you all know that I don't sing. But I have sung in the Spirit. Hallelujah. By myself. Now, I want to make a comment, and this is not, you know, I, I want you to understand, I'm, I'm not <coughs> playing down this, but a church is totally out of order if everybody gets together and they talk or sing in tongues because you're not going to reach people because no one knows what you're saying. And that's just, that's just plain as day. I mean, you don't even need Paul telling you that. They'll think you're mad. <laughs> you don't need Paul telling you that. They'll know you're mad. But anyway, but uh, it's important that you keep your focus 
and don't abuse the gifts that God gives you. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, make a comment about that because that was really on my mind um, to talk about it. Um, the first time I ever heard anybody speaking in tongues, um, we were all holding hands in the church, and it was like angels singing. It was all like in one accord, and it was so wonderful. And I was holding on to my aunt's hand, and there was a, a man in a wheelchair to my left. And it was just like something come through me from one end and out the other. And she said that was the Holy Ghost. Well, that guy got saved that day. He died a week later. So I've always thought that when everybody was like singing in one accord in tongues, it was just... Um, it's like I really realized that speaking in tongues was real. And that you just like said that if the church, the whole church is doing it, that it's not right. So well, it's got to be in now its... I'm a little confused. No, no, it's got to be in its proper... It's got to be in its proper perspective. It's got to be in its proper perspective. Let's say 20 people in the church, you're all born again. They know the Spirit of God. There's no visitors. Then that's appropriate. But if you've got people that are lost in the church... It's very inappropriate. And so Paul explained that very clearly, that you don't do it. And now that, that we're, we're opening up more worms here, but you know there is the, the message of tongues and interpretation that convicts the, the unbeliever. That's a different story. I'm talking about everybody getting together and praying in tongues. It's, it's appropriate if you're a small group of people and there's no lost people there, but it's inappropriate to do that when you've got people sitting in the auditorium that need to hear the understanding. They it, need the understanding of the gospel in their life. If you, take, if you take 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, chapter 12, Paul is telling about the gifts and what they do and what they are. In chapter 13, he's saying that love is the most important thing. Without love, you're, you know, you're, you're stranded, you're outcast, you're shipwrecked. And in, in, in chapter 14, he instructs us on the proper use, not only of tongues, yeah. but of all these gifts. Very clear. And then when he comes down toward the end of the chapter, he said what James mentioned a while ago. The, so, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, if you have a gift and, and it's inappropriate for you to, uh, to exhibit that gift at that point, you have the power to say it's not appropriate for this time. Right, because and the Holy Ghost will not will not make you do something that would be untoward or indecent or out of order. Exactly. Y'all try to remember that in the Book of Acts it says they spake with tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. They spoke, they spoke, and they spoke as the Spirit of God gave utterance. And so we need to understand if anybody tells you, well, when God moves on me, I've got to do it, you know. No matter what happens in the middle of the service, the guy's preaching it. God moves on me, i got to do it. You're an idiot. Hey, ask his wife. You're a troublemaker. <laughs> ask his wife if he's like that at home. <laughs> when, my wife, when, when my wife works on me, i just got to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just... Uh, since you're talking all about this and the Holy Ghost and the different, you know, things that happen, I remember the first time I'd gotten saved and God was, I was, knew I needed to be in church, but I didn't know which church. So I started attending different churches. And, and I went to a four square church because I, as a youth, I came with Jay Louvier in the bread box, but I'd never been into the four square sanctuary. So now that I, when I first got saved in that, that essence, I decided to go into the sanctuary of a, of a four square church. And they were all speaking in tongues. And, and I was scared. It, it scared me. I, and I thought, I should leave, but I'm afraid they might eat me if I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I stayed through the service. And because like, like Paul said, if one comes in unlearned and that's where I was. I was unlearned, and I came in. Will they not say you're mad, you're barbarian? Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what I said. I said, they're crazy, they're mad, they're barbarians. But then I found by the grace of God and the direction 
and the learning in the scriptures where it is appropriate when the Spirit of God it, moves It is you, appropriate. And the Spirit is giving you the utterance and the Spirit is giving you an interpretation because the Word says, do all speak in the Spirit? You know, do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No, because it's nothing we can do. We can't do Coca-Cola. It's, it's only what God can do. I can do Coca-Cola. The Holy Ghost. Amen. And that's what makes you real. I don't know. I don't know whose glasses these are, but they belong to someone who has tadpole eyes. I can't hardly look through them. You pick up the wrong glasses. Is that your glasses? No, I'm wearing mine. They might be my other. Glasses. They probably are. Man, you're blind. There's little green stuff all over them. Little green? No. Well, anyway, I can't give them away. Anybody have question, comment? We're going to wrap this up. We're glad that you came. Criticism? <laughs> criticism? Well, question, comment, criticism. Credos? Kudos? Um, also, um, I learned during that time um, about speaking in tongues. They said that when you're speaking in tongues, the devil cannot understand what's going on. The what now? The devil cannot understand it. He, well, he cannot I, interpret. Well, I've, I've heard that, but he doesn't understand what's going on when you're doing groanings and utterings before the Lord, too. The Holy Ghost is taking it to the throne room. I, I, can, I can accept that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to be dismissed. Dale? Maybe you can help me out. When I start speaking tongues... The old devil says, you're just doing it yourself. Yeah. And so Come I stop. See? So wh where am I? I need, I need more faith or what? No, you need to just go ahead and keep praying in tongues. Because you need to understand that whatever God is doing in your heart, it's going to get to the throne. And God's going to deliver it. The Holy Ghost is going to deliver it to the throne. And what's in your heart is going to be there at the great intercessor. So don't let the devil lie to you. Right. Amen. Right. Uh, I mean, there's the old story where two drunks got on the bar stool and one of the drunks said to the other drunk, I went to church and I heard someone talking in tongues. And the other drunk said, that's, that's of the devil. And the other drunk says, I'm confused. If that's of the devil, and we've been attending this bar for years, why hadn't we heard it before now? Hello? That's really good. Yeah, we've all felt that way. We've all felt yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah, that's that true. That's such a good question. We've all that is a great question. But God knows your heart. Whatever sounds you make, it doesn't matter if you're moving your tongue or not. Right. He knows your heart. Yes, that's true. That's right. And God will honor every effort you make to get close to Him. And God will honor every effort you make to get close to Him. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a full gospel church. In fact, I prayed that the Lord would fill me with the Holy Ghost. And they went through one of the deals, laid hands on me and said, you got it, you got it. And when I left the church, I said to my heart, I didn't get it. And the devil said, no, you didn't get it. And so I took the key to a Baptist church that I was attending in the middle of the night. And I walked into that Baptist church in the middle of the night. The Holy Spirit told me, do not turn the lights on. Just go to the altar in the dark and worship me and praise me. And I said to myself, I'm going to stay here if I have to stay here for the next six weeks. They'll have to bring me food. I'm not leaving. I'm just going to stay right here until I know. And in the middle of my worshiping God, the building, concrete building, old block house. It's the old ice plant in Ozark, the old ice plant that converted into a church. And that house, that, that building popped and shook like there was an earthquake. And when it did, I was in the altar, and it was just like someone behind me. I was afraid to look behind me for fear that I would see whatever was there. I was in the dark, and it was just like the Lord had poured hot honey over my head all the way down to my feet. And when that filled my spirit, I began to pray in the Spirit of God. And so, you know... Um, if the devil pushes you, 
Let him push you. He's going to push you into a good place. He keeps pushing. And you'll be in a place of God's blessing. Amen? Let me encourage you, Dale, just one idea here. Um, the gifts, uh, Romans eleven twenty nine 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. It means that he's not changing his mind in your plan that he has for you. If he saw fit to give you a gift, you still have that gift. I don't sure. care what it is. And, uh, and, and it, it hasn't gone anywhere. You still have it. And it would just be a matter of praying to exercise that gift in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's true. Because he, does, he's not, he doesn't take it back. If he gave you something, he gave it to you. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you need to be refreshed and stirred up. Amen. All right, we're going to be dismissed if there is no other questions. Did you enjoy tonight? Amen. 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 You're a good Baptist. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you, buddy. Man, you're an awesome Baptist. Let me shake your hand again. You're incredible. <laughs> well, you're an incredible Baptist. You're an incredible Baptist too. <laughs> you're an incredible Baptist. <laughs> even had fan mail that said that. So we yeah, we get mail. It said that there was one guy that said that, that I was such a good Baptist, he thought I was better than a Democrat now. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he thought of me before he saw that program. <laughs> I, I still get mail about you. <laughs> yeah, I get mail about him. They said that little short guy that's a Baptist. He does a better job than you. Well, thank you. No. Keep your letters coming. No. He, the, there's a guy that watches you every time. Oh, wow. He just wants to see what you're going to say. Well, so do I. <laughs> I guess we'll finish up the book of Jude some other time. Well, we got a good chance next month. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be out next Sunday. Let me encourage you. Get along with God. Get along with God in your prayer. Talk to God. Worship God. What do you do it through moaning and groaning? And what do you do it with understanding? Or you just sit there and sweat bullets for an hour? Get along with God. Because God will honor your prayer life. The Bible is very clear in Matthew 6, 6. When you pray, enter into your closet, shut the door. And the Father who sees you in secret he will reward you openly. He hears you in secret. He'll reward you openly. And uh, Brother Dale, whatever approach we do to the Lord, whoever you are, whatever you go, God's going to meet you where your faith is, and he's going to meet your hungry heart. Absolutely. I, I, even if you're handling snakes, God's going to meet you with your hungry heart. <laughs> We're not, but you know. You mean we got to quit. Wow, there's so much Bible here in so little time. <laughs> That's, yeah. I was looking for a passage. There was one time that Daniel said that he said he just sat a stone which means he was just stunned. He was just quiet being in the presence of, yeah, uh, of the Holy Ghost. That's a form of prayer. He was just. That is just a form of prayer. Couldn't talk, couldn't think. All he could think about was the presence of God. That was just all, said that it just stunned him. Like that, stunned that him. That is a form of prayer. Prayer doesn't have to be vocal. Prayer has to be reaching up from your heart. That's what prayer is, reaching up from your heart. It doesn't have to be vocal. It just has to be reaching up from Amen. your heart to God. And God will take care of your prayer life. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right, we're done. We're done. Jimmy? Yes. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. You had a great time? I had a wonderful time. All right. Praise the Lord. You may not think you had such a good time. The overseer watches this. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all good. We serve a risen Brother Savior. Jimmy is a solid doctrinal preacher, and I love his church. The Galena First Baptist Church, he's solid, he's, he's strong, and he's doctrinally sound. And he's a blessing to me. It's a great honor to have such a great brother in the Lord. I can say the same things about James, and they'd all be true. All right. Amen. Good stuff.
My ask Brother Chris if he would dismiss us in prayer. We'll see you Wednesday night, Judy's birthday. Come see what we do to her. Brother Chris. <laughs>